Welcome. Uh, this is the next lecture where we are going to uh, show you how to use a linet for your color images. And uh, the difference where it comes down from a standard linet, uh, as in for MNIST classification, is that over there they were all grayscale images of uh, 32 cross 32 and we were processing out. Now we are going to use another new data set which is called a CIFAR. And on over here, though your spatial span of the images are still restricted to 32 cross 32 but they are all color images. So, your input is no more one single channel, but it is three channels of input which comes down to you. So, that is where it will have to modify because your network cannot anymore be just taking down one single channel input over there and the data complexity and the uh, total number of tunable parameters will also be changing. So, as we go through it, I will uh, get down more and more into it. So, the first part uh, is the uh, same uh, on uh, just trying to write down your header and your initial files which have to be called down and then the next part is subsequently to get your uh, data loaded. Now, what we do is uh, we try to stick down to a similar kind of a conformal thing as we had uh, in our MNIST classification problems with Linet and that was to take down just 100 uh, images on my batch and uh, then subsequently do it. So, here also I am trying to stick down to the same batch size of 100 images. My uh, training set is trying to load it down from the inbuilt torch data sets folder which also supports CIFAR. Now, CIFAR is basically natural images available and of small say there are cats, dogs, animals, uh, bicycles kind of thing and there are 10 categories and that is why it is also called as uh, CIFAR 10. Now, you can just load down the data set uh, using the same train set and uh, uh, train loader function over there and this will just uh, download if it is not already downloaded and then, then do it. So, this is quite similar to using any of the standard data sets uh, as we had been using for MNIST as well in the earlier examples. So, let us uh, load this file. Uh, so, so it, it just uh, sees that uh, files are already present and then they are verified and it is ok. So, my two uh, trainers are created over here. Now, the next part over here is to get down and uh, actually print down the number of samples. So, I just print it down and uh, quite uh, on, the, on the different side is that uh, while on MNIST you had uh, 60,000 examples for your training, here we just have 50,000 examples for training and then 10,000 examples for uh, the testing over here. So, it is uh, that is that's the only difference which comes down. But other than that, uh, the next difference is obviously they are not grayscale images and these are color images and that will uh, make a modification to my network definition. So, let us get into the network definition over here. Okay. So, here uh, what I do is I uh, try to get down a convolution which uh, takes in three channels on my input. Okay and then generate 6 channels on my output. So, you remember the first layer of a linet and what it was doing is that my whatever was my input it will do a 5 cross 5 uh, convolution over there and then generate uh, uh, that many number of outputs which is equal to the number of unique convolution kernels. However, over here what I have is that uh, I have a 3 channel input over here. It is no more single channel or a grayscale image which goes into it. So, it is a color image which comes in. So, from there I am mapping it down to 6 uh, via 6 uh, such convolution kernels and each of this convolution kernel has a spatial spread of 5 comma 5 or 5 cross 5 and that is what is written over here. We uh, do are not any more explicitly specifying what is the kernel size and what is the patch, but because the first uh, argument which goes into uh, a conf 2D operator is actually the kernel size over there. Okay. So, the stride over here still says as 1 comma 1 and then there are no paddings which are introduced over there. The next part is to do a max pooling and the max pooling over here is to do a 2D max pooling with a 2 cross 2 kernel and with a stride of 2. So, this uh, goes down the same way as we had in the earlier case. Now, once this part is done, the next part is actually to go down and get a uh, get the next convolution being defined over there. So, for the next convolution which we define over here, it is it's what maps down 6 channels onto 16 channels and uh, with a kernel size of 5 cross 5. Okay. Now, that is done and then pretty much set over there. Now, the next part is basically to map down all my outputs coming down over here um, and then map it down to 120. Now, uh, uh, where we make a difference uh, over here is just over here taking down that we are just taking in one, one single uh, input coming down. Okay. Uh, instead of one single input, you have three channel inputs coming down and the rest of the network uh, pretty much stays the same. Now, what I do inside over here is uh, I define my forward pass and for my forward pass what I am doing is I have my uh, convolutional, uh, the first convolution operator written down uh, con 1 and I do a ReLU or uh, basically uh, uh, a nonlinear transfer function over there and then a pooling operator. 
Now see one thing, what I have is that since I'm going to use the same kind of a pool in two instances, it's always a two cross two uh, max pooling and doing it. So I'm no more defining it as two different pooling layers which are actually the same in their function. And I can actually do away by calling them uh, one after the other. So in case there were two different kinds of pooling operator then maybe define two different pooling operators otherwise it doesn't make a sense. However, for convolution we had to define two different convolutions because the number of input channels over there was quite different in both the cases as well as the number of output channels are different. In case say the input output mapping uh, and the kernel size everything is same you can just define it once as one module and then within the forward pass you can keep on re recursively calling that module as many times as you want. So later down in, in more deeper networks and more detailed networks is where we will get into reusing all of these but the first kind of a reuse which you see over here for any kind of a, a functional structure that's the pool layer which comes down. So once I have this output coming over here the next part is to actually flatten it out and get down a linear uh, combination of 400 neurons coming and that's what's connect down uh, over here from 400 neurons on to 120 neurons okay that's that's what I do over here as uh, my forward pass through FC1 and then doing a nonlinear transformation as a ReLU. The next one is to do a forward pass over FC3 and then a uh, ReLU and then the next one is to do a forward pass over FC3 and that gives me 10 outputs over here and since this is a classification network as in the earlier case we had a log softmax written down, we write down the same log softmax over here. So this is about defining the network, let us run it and then I have my uh, network to be defined. So that is what is defined as net. Okay, at this point of time, I have my uh, uh, network defined and all the weights initialized and available to me for uh, further usage. So this is quite straightforward. Uh, we did see that uh, what I have is basically uh, convolution which goes down over here, then a max pooling uh, operator on the 2D side of it and then again a convolution and then my linear uh, combinations coming down. And then this is a very straightforward way of looking down into whatever I wanted to define in terms of writing down um, just single arguments coming into it is what has actually been defined on the uh, system over there and then there is nothing wrong. And this pool operator over here is what is being reused. So the output which comes over here again goes through pool and then that output is what is fed down over here and you could pretty much do this uh, uh, sort of reuse of each of the modules because your uh, forward function is how the data mapping is mapped down. It is not in the order of exactly how these things come, you can have them quite juggled up, up and down as well. But then uh, the only thing which defines how the data flows is just this forward function which is where it is written. So this was to give you a first uh, hint. Uh, for the first time that uh, it's it's not necessary that all your structures will have to be written down in the same order. It's just for convenience and for easy to debug uh, when you are trying to look into it that all the structures as they would come down they are written in the same order as how the network gets built up. But then that's not a necessity from the uh, perspective of handling the data. The only necessity is that your forward function is properly defined which can take in the data in that particular format. And then what I do is once my network is defined I try to just copy down my weights and keep them for my further use. So this is in line with what we had done in the earlier lecture where I was trying to show you that at the end of training how many of these weights have actually changed and what is the kind of a change which happens over there. Next I check down for my availability of a GPU and yes my GPU is available so it is a great news and then I can get started with uh, defining it. So since it is a classification function which I am using over here, classification problem which I am using so my cost function or the criterion over here still stays as negative log likelihood without much of an issue. The optimizer uh, as in from our earlier expenses, uh, experiences coming down uh, we stick down to using an adapt or an adaptive momentum optimizer over here. So that is what is defined and then let us get into my training part over there. Now the trainer does not have much of a difference coming in, um, uh, we just train it over uh, 10 iterations or 10 epochs over there. Within each epoch what I am doing is uh, I just load my data and then if it is on the GPU then I just convert it onto my GPU and then uh, uh, just zero down on the gradients for the optimizer do a feed forward over the network and get down my output. So whatever is this batch size of the data which is over here, so my outputs are also of the same batch size. And then uh, I find out what my loss is or, or what is the number of errors, uh, wrong things which it has made down while getting classified through this network and then do a nabla of loss or the gradient of the loss coming down over here and finally get down to my optimizer and a step on the optimizer over there. 
Finally, the point is to uh, go down as uh, running loss and then to get down what is the total loss which comes down over here and then from there come down to what is the average loss uh, during training and then uh, just keep on adding it down over the epochs. Okay. Now that is uh, great and good part, the next part is actually over within an epoch to actually look down into what is the way of how this uh, whole thing has performed. So, in the earlier case we just had evaluated our uh, errors or the losses using our uh, training data, but here the point is uh, independently over my test data set which has uh, 10,000 examples, how does it behave. So, here what I am trying to do is um, in case the GPU is available then uh, just convert all of my uh, inputs into a variable which is CUDA typecasted available on the GPU then do a feed forward over the network and then find out my predicted. And over here whichever neuron is supposed to have the highest prediction value or the highest probability is what it will throw out then I just find out uh, which index over there or that is the class which is the highest probability of being predicted out. And then uh, from here what I do is uh, just convert it onto a CPU. Uh, number and that is because the rest of the computations are what run on the CPU and not on the GPU. So, in case I am just um, I do not have an access to a GPU, so this part will not be running and then I just run on this part, then it is it is not an issue because my predicted is what is already available on the CPU and then I find out my total uh, number of corrects and if, if whatever is predicted matches down the exact class level of what was present in my testing data, then it is perfect, it is correctly predicted. So, what I do is I have down uh, my uh, scores given down over 10,000 examples. So, that is the total number of things which have to be classified. So, my average correct value or the accuracy is basically divided by 10,000 on my uh, test data. And then uh, I just keep on appending my uh, test accuracies across all the epochs which have come down over here. So, from there going on to how to actually start plotting this uh, loss functions over here. So, the first part is um, actually to look down and then try to plot down the loss, uh, the, the plot of all the losses which comes down. The next part is actually to get down what is the total accuracy and then plot down the accuracy is coming up as well. So, once that is done, uh, we just look into this part which is to look down uh, per iteration as it keeps on printing and then, then finally, uh, just prints out what is the final um, total amount of time taken down for this to happen. So, let us get this uh, one running. Now, once you would, uh, once you invoke it out and then the training has started down, you say see that it takes down about uh, roughly 4 uh, seconds to work down per epoch and then uh, it starts with an initial accuracy of 28 percent. So, that is not something which is quite uh, convincing to most of you because in the earlier example you saw that it itself started down with an initial accuracy of about 88 percent that was, but then you need to remember one thing in mind that uh, that problem was rather a simpler problem because you just had grayscale images where the background was pretty much black and the foreground in which something is written down is, is just in uh, higher intensities or like full value of 1 if you are looking down in the floating one number system. So, 0 and 1 and there is a very high amount of contrast between things and uh, it is just based on different strokes in my writing pattern that it is easy to discriminate. Whereas, here these are small natural images. So, there are cats, dogs, apples, uh, cars, bikes, each of small size thumbnails of, of size of uh, uh, 32 cross 32. Now, uh, given this point that say if you have a bus which is in the size of 32 cross 32 pixels versus if you have a small minivan versus if you have a um, uh, some sort of a truck given down in small small uh, thumbnail sized images, it is really even for humans it is it is a hard problem to understand. So, here it is also facing the same kind of a problem most likely like it is just uh, confusing around uh, with these similar looking objects which are getting bound together. So, that is one of the reasons why you do not initially get to see that high accuracy coming down. However, one major point is that at the end of the training um, when it took down uh, 37 seconds, you can still still see that there is a monotonic decrease in the loss curve as well as a monotonic increase in the accuracies coming down over here. And that makes us to one of these points that if we keep on training it down for a uh, larger number of epochs or say put it down to train down for 100 epochs, you would pretty easily see that this goes down much above the 80 percent benchmark. Now, one more thing you need to keep in mind is also play down with the learning rates over there. So, change the learning rate uh, iteratively as we had discussed in the earlier classes of how to come down to convergences. So, after every say 10th um, uh, epoch, you just reduce the learning rate by half of it and then let it keep on going down over there. And you would see that there will be a monotonic decrease and eventually it will come down to its most saturation point over there. So, once uh, that is done, the next part is to actually look into uh, my weights of uh, what it was before my training and after my training. So, we make use of a similar kind of uh, 
uh, argument and objective as we had in the earlier case. Uh, the only difference over here which would come down is in the earlier case your first layer of weights was what is connecting a grayscale onto uh, my, my number of channels and the number of weights over there is equal to the total number of channels which comes down over here. Now here I have an RGB image, uh, 3 channel image coming down because uh, my, my total number of uh, say planes on my convolution kernel is also equal to the total number of planes in my input uh, image or the total number of channels over there. And that is why you would be seeing down that in your first convolution uh, kernel in the earlier case while you were just seeing grayscale weights here you are going to see down color weights because each there is a weight associated with the red channel with the green channel blue channel and this is a composite visualization of each of them which comes out. There are 6 kernels in the first convolution layer so these correspond to the 6 kernels each is of a size of 5 cross 5 1 2 3 4 5 1 2 3 4 5 so it is a 5 cross 5 which comes down over here. The next part uh, is this is the weight these basically these are all the weights uh, which are there before the training and these are the weights which the kernel takes in after the training and it looks more of like a chessboard a very decorated piece of chessboard and then nothing uh, much to convey down you do not see gradients or anything coming down but then you also need to keep in mind that uh, the network as such has not come down to a great performance it is not even barely 50 percent on the accuracy side of it. However, it is doing much better than a random chance because if you had to classify down 10 different classes then the random chance is 1 tenth or uh, uh, 0.1 uh, uh, sorry sorry 10 percent is the random chance and that would come down to an accuracy of uh, 0.1 actually. So, instead of that this standing at 0.45 uh, or more than that is actually a much better performance than just a random guess. So, anyways these, these weights are not yet trained though if you look into the difference you would see that there are gradients which are changing now. So, there are changes in, in the gradients in the green channel there are changes in gradients in, in blue so which is basically uh, one of the other channels other than green which is present. Now, here do you see that there is some sort of a change in the brown shade so it means that there has been changes in red, green and blue all of them taken down and most predominantly it is basically a green and red where the change is coming down. So, these look like shades of purple which is where the differences are in the planes of uh, blue and red. This is where it is more of like a mix of green and blue where the changes are coming down and again you have your brown. So, uh, going back to your uh, uh, basic knowledge of colors within digital image processing you can pretty much make a uh, impression of where which channels are getting changed over there and you see the changes coming down in color because your images and objects on the side of in color. However, when I try to look into my second uh, layer over there so I am just taking down my first uh, kernel of convolution and then try to look into all the 6 channels over there. So, I, I see each of my 6 uh, channels uh, which are which connect down my output of the first convolution layers and look over there. So, each is a 5 cross 5 in the same logic and, and this is just my first convolution kernel on the second one. Uh, if I look between the weights of what is when it is not trained versus when it is trained there are minor amount of changes which I would see and however, on the difference I do see that there are gradients which are setting down over here. So, this is what comes down as we keep on moving towards uh, color images. So, now that is as, as in with autoencoders when I was explaining you for grayscale images to color images and there was one uh, uh, very immense uh, important point which was made down as that there is technically at this point of time no uh, solution given down or there is no definite answer of uh, when it will converge what kind of an architecture would come down as the best one that is that is still a challenge to be solved out over here. And so, you see that in over here as well it is the same kind of an architecture with the similar number of weights and everything which goes down. Uh, the kind of performance it has on grayscale images versus the kind of performance it has on color images is drastically different. And one of the reasons is on, on your grayscale images of MNIST you had a much conformal way of representing the data. It was much easier to learn down very definitive patterns and that is why it was able to classify them in a much better way. Whereas, if you go down to your color images then the way in which it would be learned be able to learn down some discriminative patterns which are of really importance and would make down sense is much low. And, and for that reason it takes it longer and longer to learn it out. So, if you keep on running this code over a larger number of iterations say just change down go up over here and where I have my number of iterations if you just make and change this to 100 or maybe 1000 you would be seeing that this comes down to a much conformal way of uh, uh, a decent amount of accuracy and a much lower loss. So, that is where uh, we come to an end uh, with writing down very plain and simple convolutional neural networks. So, stay tuned for the next ones where we uh, start uh, digging into deeper neural networks and why they are called as deeper neural networks and more computational complexity issues around with them. So, till then thanks and stay tuned.